The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. This is a very special occasion for me. I'm to be a little more than your host. This time, I will not only be introducing the story, but telling it to you, acting it out. The Mystery Theater's special Christmas story this year, Charles Dickens' the immortal classic, A Christmas Carol, with Guess Who as Scrooge. Bah! Humbug! mystery drama, A Christmas Carol, was adapted from the Charles Dickens classic, especially for the Mystery Theater, by Ian Martin. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol begins like this. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt about that, whatever. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner, Scrooge, signed it. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Ebenezer Scrooge? Oh, he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, hard and sharp as flint from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire. Solitary as an oyster. He iced his office in the dog days and didn't thaw it out one degree, even at Christmas. A Merry Christmas, Uncle God save you. Uh, what, what, oh, what, oh, it's you, nephew. What brings you here on a miserable, cold, windy night like tonight? Ah, cold and windy, yes, and the snow falling softly. A perfect Christmas Eve to say, Merry Christmas, Uncle. Ah, humbug. Christmas, a humbug? Oh, you don't mean that, I'm sure. I do. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry, or the world at large? What reason have you yourself to be merry? You're poor enough. Oh, come then. <laughs> what reason of you to be dismal? What reason of you to be morose? You're rich enough. Don't you taunt me, Fred. Bah! And don't indulge yourself in expectations. Humbug. Take me as I am, Uncle, and as the season is, and don't be cross. Where else can I be when I live in a world of fools? Christmas. Fooey. What's Christmas time to you but a time for paying bills without money? Time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled in his own plum pudding and buried with a steak of holly to his heart. Oh, come along, Uncle. Can you not let down for once and enjoy your <laughs> men? For... Come along, nephew. Keep Christmas in your own way. Let me keep it in mind. Yes, but you don't keep it. Leave me alone, Nan. Much good it may do you. Much good has it ever done you. Oh, there are a lot of things, Uncle, from which I've never profited. Christmas among the rest. Except that when it comes around, who can resist it? A kind of forgiving time of year when men and women seem by one consent to open up their hearts freely. So then I say, Uncle, though it never put a scrap of silver or gold in my pocket, I believe it has and will do me good. And so I say, God bless it. Who's that? Where? What's all that there? I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Scrooge. It's it's just that it is a holiday, and and my hands were so cold. Yes, let me hear another word from you, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your employment. Oh, please, sir, I I humbly beg your pardon. It was just a an action on the spur of the moment. Well, just apply the spur to goad you into finishing your work, Cratchit, and let's hear no more from you. Yes, sir. Well, nephew. Why are you here? To ask you to dine with us tomorrow. Dine with you? Never. 
There's nothing more ridiculous than all the fuss and expense over Christmas dinner. Oh, Uncle, I want and ask nothing from you. Why can't we be friends? Good afternoon. Well, with all my heart, I'm sorry to find you so resolute. At least, I wish you a Merry Christmas. Good afternoon. And a Happy New Year. Good afternoon. And be sure to make the front door fast. No wasting of heat here. No extra logs on the fire. Yes, Uncle. Mr. Cratchit. Yes, sir. May I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. The first I am sure of, and I and I thank you. The other... Ah, I... who knows what the future holds. Be of good hope. The nerve of all of them. My nephew, Westrow, and Bob Cratchit on 15 shillings a week with a wife and family talking about a Merry Christmas. <laughs> it's enough to make a man retire to Bedlam. They're all mad, mad. Uh, begging your pardon, Mr. Scrooge. A gentleman to see you? Yes, 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 yes. Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. Have I the honor of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Mr. Marley's been dead for seven years. He died seven years ago this very night. Ah, sad. Sad indeed. Still, I have no doubt his liberality is well represented by his surviving partner. Liberality? At this festive season, it is more than usually desirable that we all make some slight provision for the poor and destitute. Now, you may make your pledge here. Are there no prisons? We speak of the needy. Uh, the union workhouses are not still in operation. They are. I wish I could say they were not. A few of us private citizens are endeavoring to raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. Uh, what shall I put you down for, Mr. Scrooge? Nothing. Now, of course, you wish to be anonymous? I wish to be left alone. By tax, I help to support the establishments we have mentioned. They cost enough and more. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there. And many would rather die. <laughs> they would rather die than let them do so and decrease the surplus population. Good afternoon, sir, whatever your name is. I find you hard to believe, Mr. Scrooge. Cratchit, let him out. Close the door, Cratchit. To extinguish what cold remains. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, no, sir. You come here. Uh, coming, Mr. Scrooge. You want all day tomorrow, I suppose. It's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient, and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, you'd think yourself ill-used, I'd be bound. Well, sir, I And mean... yet you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. I, I would not presume to have an opinion, but then it is only one day a year. Yeah, a poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. But I suppose I have no choice. You must have the whole day. Just make sure you are here earlier the following morning. I dined my usual melancholy dinner in the usual melancholy tavern. Afterwards, climbed the stairs to my living quarters in the gloom. Something about my door knocker stopped me as I was about to put key in lock. For one strange moment, it looked like Marley. Ghostly spectacles turned up on its ghostly forehead. To say that I was not startled would not be strictly true. And even after I was entered and locked in and my candlelit, I did pause irresolutely before I dismissed it with humbug, <laughs> humbug. Still, I was uneasy. Trimming my candle, I walked through all my rooms to make sure all was well. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as it should be. Small fire in the grate, spoon and basin ready, a little saucepan of gruel. Since I had a cold. What's that? The front door. The side door. The bell by my bed. The one on the mantel and, and, and on the sideboard. What do they herald? Who rings them? The cellar door. And that noise. What? what? Uh, I won't believe it. Oh! Hey, 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 there is humbug still. 
Grim Spectre, what do you want with me? Uh, much. Who are you? Ask me who I was. Who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Uh, you don't believe in I me? I don't. Why do you doubt your senses? Because a little thing affects them. A slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheats. You may be a bit of undigested beef, a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of underdone potato. There's more of gravy about you than the grave, wherever you are. <laughs> humbug, I tell you, humbug. Ah! Ah! Unbeliever! So... I unwrapped the bandages from about my head to reveal the rotting flesh, the jaw fallen slackly to my breast, the muscles eaten long since by worms. Oh. Now, do you believe oh. me for who and what I am? Yes, oh, mercy, dread apparition. Why do you trouble me? I must. Why are you fettered and bound in chains? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link. I girded it on of my own free will. Is its pattern so strange to you? Or would you learn the weight and length of the coil you wear yourself? It was full and as heavy and as long as mine these seven Christmas Eves ago. And you have labored on it since. Ah, my once partner in life, what a ponderous chain you have built to drag you down in death. No, no, Jacob. Old Jacob Marley, speak some comfort to me. I have none to give. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting house in life. So, in death, weary journeys lie before me. Seven years dead and traveling all the time? No rest. No peace. The incessant torture of remorse. I am here tonight, Ebenezer. To warn you that you have yet a hope of escaping my fate. Oh, you were always a good friend, Sankey. You will be haunted by three spirits. That is the hope you mentioned? It is. Uh, I, 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 I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you have no hope but to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow. When the bell tolls what? But couldn't I take them all at once and have it over? Expect the second on the next night at the same hour. The third, when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate on your mantel clock. And for your own sake, remember what has passed between us. Passed between us. Jacob, uh, do not leave me yet. But he was gone, as if he had never been. And yet, he had been. And Ebenezer Scrooge would never be the same man again. He fell asleep without undressing upon the instant. A sleep that was destined to be disturbed, as I shall relate when I return with Act Two. When Scrooge awoke, it was dark, and the chimes of a neighborhood church were striking the four quarters. To his amazement, they were followed by twelve strokes of the bell. Twelve? Impossible. It was two when he went to bed. Uh, oh, why, it isn't possible. I could have slept through a whole day and far into another night. 
As I lay, I suddenly remembered that Marley had said a ghost would visit me at one. Who are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? Your past. Don't you recognize me? A strange figure, almost like a child. The outlines dimly seen. It wore a tunic of purest white and a branch of fresh green holly in its hand, in the singular contradiction to the dress which was trimmed with summer flowers. But strangest of all, above its crown sprang a bright, clear jet of light, which illuminated the darkest corner, but obscured the face. And under its arm, a cap, which looked for all the world like a candle snuffer. For some reason, I wanted it to put on its cap. Uh, the light is blinding. Would you not put on your cap? Would you so soon put out with worldly hands the light I shed? Is it not enough that you are the one who fashioned me this cap and forced me to wear it low upon my brow? I? What business brings you here? Your welfare. Well, if you would regard my welfare, you would leave my sleep unbroken. Your reclamation, then. Take heed. Rise and walk with me. I cannot resist your command, but I am an old man, lightly clad and... <laughs> Nursing a cold to boot. Do not deny me. Come. Follow me. All of a sudden, I was flying, floating on air. The night had vanished as the city below me, and I was looking down on the country in the clear, cold light of day, with snow dusting the ground. Good heavens. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. Your lip is trembling. What is that upon your cheek? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The, the wind makes my eyes water. Lead me where you will. Do you not remember the way? Remember it. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it so many years. Let us set our feet on the road. I will not tell you most of where we wandered as time stood still or raced ahead at a whim. The school where I was a child. The house I grew up in, an orphan. A terrible rush of tears remembering another outcast, a foreigner. An alien who in our mutual loneliness had once befriended me. <laughs> Poor Alibaba. I... I... It's too late now. What is too late? Uh, nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. What might have been. Let us see another Christmas. What's that? Your aunt, who brought you up, passed away. Oh, Always no. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered, but she had a large heart. Amen to that. I will not gainsay it, spirit. When she died, she had, I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew. Yes. We traveled further, scenes flashing by like slides in a magic lantern. Old Fezziwig, in his Welsh wig, my first employer, his Christmas parties with a groaning table and everyone dancing with a light foot and heart to the festive music. His kind wife and the joy of working at a desk one wasn't nailed to. And then, someone I had shut away so long ago. What is it, Scrooge? That girl. Whom you shall sit beside. No. Oh, yes. This shadow most of all. Don't you remember me? I told you the light blinds me. Then remember me as I was before you put my light out. No tears, I beg you. None. If the idol who has replaced me can cheer and comfort you, I must not grieve. What idol? A golden one. Nothing but gain engrosses you. So, if I have grown wiser... I am not changed toward you. Our marriage contract was made when we were both poor. 
You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Whatever you were, I freely offer you your release. Have I ever sought it? In words? Never. How, then? In a changed nature. In everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. And so I release you with a full heart for the love of what once you were. May you be happy in the life you've chosen. Now I recognize you, spirits, and why you've come back to haunt me. Torture me no more. Some shadows still to see. No, I can bear it no longer. Haunt me no longer. The light you shine is too bright for my eyes to bear. Give me your cap so I may extinguish it and you. In a puff of smoke, the figure was gone, and I had barely time to reel to my bed, exhausted from the long night's travels, where I fell into a heavy sleep. What's that? Oh, oh. Um, the clock ticking away. Awake, in the night of time, almost one. When the second messenger, Marley, sends me from the grave will arrive, what ghastly shape might he take? What hideous form? What torture might this one plan for me? At least I am prepared for anything. Well, prepared for anything, but... but nothing. Hello there, spirit. Are you invisible to me? What's that? That great light from beneath my sitting room door. Uh, here's a fearful waste of light. A shocking extravagance. I must go in and douse these candles. Yet I, I'm afraid to enter. Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge. Stop skulking there behind your bedroom door. Enter, man. Enter. Why, here's a prodigal spending of light in a great roaring blaze hot enough to set the chimney flue on fire. <laughs> Look well on me. Have you never seen the like of me before? Never. It is time your eyes were opened to this and other things. Spirit, I will be no trouble. Conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion... And I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Hold fast to my robe. In the blink of an eye, we were transported to a mean and shabby little house. Threadbare, but clean as a new washed shirt. And redolent of the mouth-watering smell of goose basking in sage and onion and aromas of an eating house and pastry cooks next together which came from the Christmas pudding. Whatever has got your precious father then and your brother Tiny Tim? I never remember him, Martha, as late as this on Christmas Day. What a place is this? House of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. See, here he comes now. That child he carries on his shoulder with a little crutch in his hand and his lower limbs bound in an iron cage. The youngest of the Cratchits, tiny Tim. Why, look at him struggle after the others as his father sets him down. Where are they off to? To watch one of the merriest sights of this merriest of seasons. The golden goose turn on the spit. Shh. Listen. How late you are, my dear. And how cold. Oh, well. oh, come. Come sit you down by the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. After I've had a look at that goose, too. First, tell me. How did Tiny Tim behave through the service? Oh, as good as gold and better. Oh. Somehow he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much. Mm. And thinks the strangest things you ever heard. I know. What was it this time? He told me, coming home, he hoped everyone in the church saw him because he was a cripple. Oh. Because it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, Bob. Bob. 
Oh, I feel so much for you. No, 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 no. You must not, my dear. Remember the day. Come, let's join the others. Tell me, spirit, will Tiny Tim live? I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner and a little crutch without an owner. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. Oh, no, kind spirit. Spare him. That from you, recall your own words. If he be like to die, he had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Oh, I am ashamed. And should be man, if you be man at heart. Forbear that wicked cant until you have discovered what the surplus is and where it is. Listen. A toast before we eat to Mr. Scrooge. To me? I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Oh, I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I'd hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Oh, my dear, the children, Christmas Day. Well, I'll drink to his health for your sake and the days. Not for his. Long life to him. A merry Christmas and a happy new year. Oh, you'll be very merry and very happy, I've no doubt. And now, a merry Christmas to us all, my dears. God bless us. God bless us, God bless merry us everyone. Yes, merry my very name merry cast a pall upon their happiness. But march you on the wealth of spirit among them which thought kindly on a man with as little spirit as yours. In particular, that poor little lad, Tiny Tim... Did you notice how generous he was to end the toast with God bless us, everyone, including even me. What a valiant little soul, in spite of all his handicaps. Perhaps your eyes are opening at last. But come, you have more to learn. Where now? Your nephew's house. <laughs> he said, he said that Christmas was a humbug. As I live, he believed it, too. More shame for him, Fred, that my uncle-in-law should speak so. Well, he's a comical old fellow and not so pleasant as he might be. Oh, yes. However, his offenses carry their own punishment and I have nothing to say against him. And I will have no downturned mouths at this season. So here is a glass of mulled wine to our hands. Let's drink to the old man. Well, he has given us plenty of merriment at that. So, to Uncle Scrooge. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to the old man, whatever he is. He wouldn't take it from me, but may he have it nevertheless. To Uncle Scrooge. To Uncle Scrooge. No, 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 wait, wait. Let, let me go to them. May explain. Too late for me. The hour grows too late. Away. <laughs> Where stand we now? This open place. A crossroads where I must leave you. Oh, forgive me what I ask, but I see something strange protruding from the skirt of your robe. That might be a claw for all the flesh there is upon it. Yes. Then see what you must see. From the sanctuary came forth a boy and a girl, yellow, meager, Ragged, scowling, wolfish, but prostrate, too, in their humility. I started back appalled. Spirit, are these yours? They are man's. The boy is ignorance, the girl is want. Beware of them both and all of their degree. But most of all, beware this boy. For on his brow I see written doom. Unless the writing can be erased. My time is sounding. Wait. Have these pitiful creatures no refuge or resource? I answer in your own words. Are there no prisons? Are there no workhouses? Hold. For one moment, help me. Where should I turn? Turn and face your future. The black phantom that approaches you now. Face your Future. Your future. As 
the last stroke of the bell struck twelve, Scrooge turned to face a dread figure, a solemn phantom, draped and hooded in blacks and deep grays, coming, creeping like the mist about it towards him. I'll return with Act Three very shortly. phantom silently, slowly, gravely approached. It was shrouded in a deep black garment which concealed its head, its face, its form and left nothing of it visible save one outstretched hand which served as its only voice for the spirit neither spoke nor moved. I am in the presence of the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You answer not, but point where we are to go. Lead on, spirit, and I will follow. A great black cloud gathered me and carried me willy-nilly to the streets. Its shroud, like the figure that stood by me, hung about me as I listened to two gentlemen talking in the street. So, Mr. Grimes, old Scratch has got his own at last. I have been so informed, Mr. Goodfellow. When did he die? Last night, I believe. What on earth could he have caught? I thought he'd never die. God knows. Why should I care? What has he done with his money? Heaven knows. Not left to charity, and certainly not to me. Left to his company, perhaps. God knows he appears not to have had any sort of personal tie. By which token, it's like to be a very cheap funeral. <laughs> For upon my life, I cannot think of anybody to go to it. How dismal and awful to dismiss another human being in such terms. Forgive me, dread ghost... I did not mean to diverge. You wish to reveal something to me? You have my full attention. Fred, the news is bad. Bad? We are quite ruined. Oh, no, there's hope for us yet. If he relents. If he forgives or forgave, there might have been. Oh, but it is too late for the miracle. Poor old miserable boy. He's past relenting. He's dead. No! Wait, spirit, wait! I'm not ready to leave. What else would you have me look on? Tell me again about today. About little Tim on the grave. It, it, it would have done you good to see how green a place it is. Oh. But you'll see it often. I promised him I would walk there every other Sunday. My last born. My poor little broken child. Pop, please. I shall break down with you. Oh, my darling. We can all try to be brave. But how can we hide our sorrow? What is more final and dreadful than death? I want to help, Spectre. But something informs me that our parting moment is at hand. Tell me, what man was it I saw lying dead? Very well. You point. Where to this time? A churchyard. And here we are. A headstone. You would have me read it? Uh, tell me, are these the shadows of things that will be or may be only? Oh, my own name, Ebenezer Scrooge. Spirit, hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been from all this intercourse. Why show me this if I am past all hope? For once... You make no motion. Your nature intercedes for me and pities me. Good spirit, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. 
the three spirits shall strive within me, I will not shut out the lessons that they teach. Oh, tell me I may sponge away the writing on this stone. Give me your hand, I beg you. Give me your hand. I hold you to me. You cannot disappear. You cannot disappear. You... Oh, oh, well, bless my soul. What I cling to is my own bedpost. And wait, wait. Perhaps my time is my own to make amends in. Yes, I will live in the past, in the present, and the future. The spirits of all three shall strive within me. Oh, Jacob Marley, heaven and Christmas time be praised for this. I say it on my knees, old Jacob, on my knees. I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather, and I am as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. I'm as giddy as a drunken man. A Merry Christmas to everyone. A Happy New Year to all the world. Hello there. Oh, hoo, 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 hello. Oh, oh, there's the saucepan the gruel's in. There's the door by which the ghost of Jacob Marley entered. There's the corner where I saw the wandering spirits. It's all right. It's true. It all happened. Oh, 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 oh my God. I don't know how long I've been among the spirits. I'm a baby. I don't know what month it is. Throw open the window and rejoin the world. Hey, Mr. Grimes, what's today? Why, uh, 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 Christmas Day. Christmas Day? I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. They can do what they like. Of course they can. Hello, my fine fellow. Uh, hello. Uh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Do you still run the poultry shop in the next street but one at the corner? I should hope I did on my way to open up. Oh, pray then, Mr. Grimes. Do I dare hope you have not yet sold the prize turkey that was hanging up there? Not the little prize turkey, the big prize turkey. <laughs> the one as big as an ostrich. Oh, a delightful man. A pleasure to talk to him. Yes, Mr. Grimes. It is hanging there now. Where? What are we waiting for? I want to buy it. Bring it here that I may give directions where to take it. Send back your boy and I'll give him a shilling. Have him bring it back in less than five minutes and I'll give him half a crown. Better still, here's a five-pound note. Send him to deliver the turkey to Mr. Cratchit by cab at the address I give you. And what's left shall be your Christmas present and his. Shaving was not an easy task, for my hand was shaking, and shaving demands attention. At last it was finished, and I dressed myself in all my best and issued forth to the streets. The first person I met was a portly gentleman who had walked into my counting house the day before, saying, Scrooge and Marley's, I believe. I hastened to intercept him. Uh, my dear sir, how do you do? I beg your pardon. I hope you succeeded yesterday. A Merry Christmas to you, sir. Mr. Scrooge. That is my name. I fear not pleasant to you. Allow me to ask your pardon, and will you have the goodness to allow me to contribute? May I have your ear, sir? Hmm? What? Lord bless me. So much. My dear Mr. Scrooge, are you really serious? If you please. Not a farthing less. Will you do me that favor? Oh, my dear sir, I don't know what to say to well, such don't say anything. Come and see me. Will you come and see me? I will indeed. Thank you. I thank you 50 times. Bless you. <laughs> Merry Christmas, I... By all that's holy, is it you, Uncle? Me, Fred. You did ask me to dinner. Am I too late to take up the invitation? <laughs> too late? Uh, will you let me in? Will I let you in? Why, here's the merriest turn a Christmas can take, darling, wife. Here's Uncle Scrooge to share our Christmas. Isn't that a present for this day? You couldn't have brought Fred a better one. Welcome to our home, Uncle. For only the first... Of many times, I hope. It's a whole new year. Yes, and you may spend it all with us, if you will. Only today, for I must be in the office as early as can be. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. Don't steal glances at each other. It isn't business on my mind, but recompense. <laughs> and since at last I have learned to laugh, <laughs> I want to have my first joke with the man I have perhaps wronged most all of these years, my faithful Bob Cratchit. <laughs> A wonderful day, an evening with my nephew, a deep sleep that might have lasted for days, except that I was bound and determined to be earlier than my clerk at the counting house that Monday morning. I was as pleased as a child when I beat him there, even more pleased to find that for once he was late. When the door opened and he came in, he was a full 18 and one half minutes behind his time. His hat and scarf were off before he opened the door. In terror of the man I had been, he was on his stool in a jiffy, writing his pen as if he were trying to overtake the lost minutes. Uh, morning, Mr. Scrooge. Morning. A little late for that. What do you mean by coming here this time of day? I, I am very sorry, sir. I am behind time. <laughs> you are? Yes, yes, I think you are. Now, step this way, sir, if you please. It's only once a year, sir. It shall not be repeated. I, I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. Now, now, I'll tell you what, my friend. I'm not going to stand by this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, I feel myself forced to raise your salary. Huh? Why, why, Mr. Scrooge, sir, do you feel all right? A I, I, merry I... Christmas, Bob. A merrier Christmas than I have given you for many a year. Not only raise your salary, but discuss your affairs and endeavor to help your struggling family over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. So, make up the fires till they hot us right out of the county house before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. It's not only a new year, but a whole new world for both of us. As we all know, Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all. And to Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. And he made a good new will for his nephew and his future partner, Bob Cratchit. One thing after a long life, he took to his grave. That he knew how to keep Christmas well. May it be truly said of all of us. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. there to say after Dickens' Christmas Carol, except the eternal message it brings, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Ian Martin, Evie Juster, Robert Dryden, and William Redfield. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Special edition of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater brought to you by your lucky discount supermarkets. We'll continue with beautiful music of the season on KIXI brought to you by the lucky discount supermarkets following the CBS News coming up next. The weather outlook calls for mostly cloudy skies with increasing chance of rain on Christmas Day. Showers tomorrow night and Friday. Highs near 50 and lows about 40. And currently in downtown Seattle 48, it's 44 at the airport.
filling the air with bright and beautiful music. This is KIXI, Seattle. CBS News is next. It's 11 o'clock. CBS News. Christmas in the Holy Land as thousands of worshipers gathered in the town of Bethlehem. I'm Eric Engberg reporting on the CBS radio network. There were religious observances in the town where Jesus was born, but there were also stringent security precautions overseen by Israeli troops in Bethlehem. Christmas Eve brought intensified fighting to Beirut, Lebanon, despite pleas from national leaders for peace. At least 17 persons died as gangs of gunmen fought each other, and the trouble continued into Christmas Day. Left-wing Muslims said they wished to spoil Christmas for their Christian rivals in retribution for the violence which took place during a Muslim holiday earlier this month. President Ford attended non-denominational Christmas services in the ski resort town of Vail, Colorado, where he's vacationing. The president and his family plan a quiet Christmas day, but Mr. Ford is expected to get in some more skiing. Meantime, he is trying actively to prevent one of his cabinet members, Labor Secretary John Dunlop, from sliding off the team, according to Press Secretary Ron Nesson. CBS News correspondent Robert Pierpoint reports from Vail. The president's spokesman said he pointed out to Mr. Ford a front-page story in a local paper predicting Dunlop would resign over the president's veto of the picketing bill after he had promised to sign it. And the president authorized Nesson to say, quote, President Ford considers John Dunlop to be an extremely valuable member of his administration and certainly hopes he does not resign. Later, Nesson said that President Ford had informed Dunlop of his decision to veto the controversial bill last Monday, but that Dunlop did not indicate to the president any thought of resigning. Nesson had no comment on AFL-CIO President George Meany's charge that President Ford had gone back on his word. Robert Pierpoint, CBS News, Vail, Colorado. At least 18 persons are dead in a hotel fire in Sydney, Australia this Christmas Day. Many people were trapped on upper floors of the five-story Savoy Hotel. Some jumped to the street below. The men who keep track of America's buying and selling to foreign countries have some good news as the end of the year approaches. The U.S., which ran a trade deficit last year, will probably finish 1975 with the largest trade surplus in 10 years. The surplus was $10.5 billion for the first 11 months of the year. Trade surpluses are generally thought to help keep the value of the dollar up abroad, resist inflation, and provide jobs for those who work in the exporting industries. By tradition, Christmas is a time of joy and family reunions, but for many people it is a time of emotional distress and even suffering. That is the opinion of psychiatrist Dr. John Donnelly, who finds that Christmas is a time when people sum up the past year in their minds. If it has been a bad year, if, for example, they have lost a loved one, then Christmas can be a difficult time. Dr. Donnelly's advice to those who feel depressed, try to keep occupied and be with other people. I'm Eric Engberg, CBS News.